Ahead on Catalyst, African livestock. Looking at the genes of ancient breeds to help modern farmers. And a surprising remedy for a stomach bug. Feces, a medical cure. G'day, welcome to Catalyst. Also on tonight's episode, take Jonica's canine concentration test. Quickly grab a pen and paper. And pachyderm problem solving. But first, no one wants their credit card details falling into the wrong hands. Well, here's Ruben with the prime way of keeping your money safe, using numbers as keys. Billions of dollars crisscross the internet every day. But all this e-commerce wouldn't be safe without some very special numbers. They're called prime numbers, numbers divisible only by themselves and one. And they've long fascinated mathematicians like my friend, Simon Pumpana. Hey, Reuben. Hey, Simon. What's this? This is a prime number. Hang on. This whole thing is one number? Yep. It's 2 raised to the power 43,112,609. Take one. Whoa, and we know that this is prime? Correct. It's been verified by computer to be the largest one known to date. So ha hang on a minute. You're saying this one gigantic number is only divisible by itself and one? You got it. It's indestructible. That's amazing. How many pages is it? 4,376. That's incredible. So why are prime numbers so useful for internet security? OK, it works like this. Start with two really big primes, call them P1 and P2, and then you multiply them together to get a composite number we'll call C. OK, and C is not a prime number? No, of course not. Okay. But the point is that while computers are very good at multiplying numbers together, if you start with C and try working back to get P1 and P2, it turns out to be super hard. Ah, right. So then what? So this number C is used to generate what's called a public key, a code that's available for anyone to use. Hence, public key. Yeah. The bank sends you this public key, which you use to encrypt your credit card or what have you. And then it returns back safe and sound. So then what? But P1 and P2 are used to decrypt this code, so they have to be kept secret. They're what's called the private key. Right, so they're not beamed across the internet. No. Only your bank or whoever is receiving your information knows what P1 and P2 are. So they're the only ones that can access my credit card. OK, but what if a thief does intercept my message? Not a problem. A hacker using a state-of-the-art computer system would need a thousand years to find the original primes and crack the code. Your bank already knows P1 and P2, so it can do it in a second. Ah, but isn't there some kind of catalogue of all the known primes that a hacker could use to crack my code? Mm, well, this is the crazy thing about primes. No one has a complete list. This Goliath is the largest prime found so far. But the number of primes yet to be discovered smaller than this one is a number the same size. Take off a couple of digits. Right, so then how big is the next biggest prime number going to be? Nobody knows. It's a mystery. <laughs> well, there you go. It's just another one of those things we just don't know. Ahead on Catalyst, can you comprehend your canine? There's a genetic revolution on the farms of the developing world. Kenyan farmers are rediscovering useful breeds, some of which have almost been neglected into extinction. All across the developing world, pressures from climate change, increased population and loss of arable land means that farmers need all the help they can get just to feed the people. And a surprising source of help comes from the genes of unusual breeds like this one. These are Ancoli cattle, one of several indigenous breeds found exclusively in Africa. And here, at the International Livestock Research Institute, indigenous breeds are the life's work of Dr. Akeo Mwai. I had passion for studying indigenous genetic animal resources. One, because they were uh, branded as not being very productive, and for a long time, not enough research focus was put on them. 
We are talking of over 150 breeds of cattle alone in Africa. There are many reasons why Africa's indigenous breeds have been ignored until recent times. Most of the developing countries went through colonial phase. The indigenous animals were not seen to be productive enough. But now, the native livestock are making a comeback, as ranch manager Simon Kibiru explains. What sort of cattle are we looking at here, Simon? We're looking at uh, the Dama cattle. They look quite small to me. Yeah, this breed is from a very dry country and actually the body seems to be smaller so that they can be able to survive in the dry areas. Traits that used to count against native cattle are now seen in a more favourable light. Local farmers are reaping the benefits of reintroducing old breeds into new herds. Now, if I saw these in Australia, I'd think they were Brahmins, but they're not, are they? Yeah, they're not Brahmins. These are East African Borans. They can withstand diseases that are found in this area, and uh, they are very good for meat. And it's not just the cattle herds that benefit from this rethink in livestock management. Dorper sheep are a breed developed by the South African government to grow meat quickly in arid areas. But these Dorpers have been crossbred with a very special local, red Maasai sheep. They don't produce wool, they've got hair. And when it comes to meat production, there are other breeds that produce a lot more meat. But these guys have got a genetic trick which will be very valuable not only to African sheep farmers, but to sheep farmers around the world. We have found that they have a genetic ability to persist a high infestation with the worms. We know that it's a heritable, therefore it's carried within the, the, the genes of the red Maasai. Dorpers, on the other hand, are vulnerable to parasites, especially during times of drought. This animal is very anemic. Anemia is one of the first signs of worm infestation. Huh? So this is a dorper animal. It's anemic, lots of worms. Last year, when we had one of the worst drought, most of the people here lost almost 60% of their dorper herd. By introducing the Red Maasai bloodline to the Dorper flock, farmers hope for the best of both worlds. Resistance to worms while maintaining a decent body weight. It's a balancing act between genomics and economics. Akeo has been working with this farmer for over 20 years to improve his flock. It all paid off during the drought when his herd came through with fewer losses than many of his neighbours. Akeo, I'm no sheep expert, but these sheep look to be in better condition, they look fatter than the ones that we saw earlier on in the day. And yet the land seems to be about the same, so what's the difference? What's happening? Oh, the difference is very simple. This uh, farmer is keener, he's been doing his breeding much better. He's more focused and started earlier returning to the red Maasai, indigenous red Maasai sheep. Back in Nairobi, Akeo keeps extensive stud books and other data tracking the successes and failures over many generations. Whereas the best animal. Today, he can also call upon DNA technology to assist him in the quest for a better African okay. flock. Our job is to race against time, not to lose the genes that are already there. So as the genomic tools are becoming much more affordable, sooner or later we're beginning to have the whole sequence of the, the sheep genome. By pinning down these valuable indigenous genes before they become extinct, researchers hope to bring a bit of red Maasai toughness to sheep across the globe. Thomas Barodi is best known for developing an antibiotic treatment for stomach ulcers. Well, now he's working on curing another tummy bug using a radical procedure. Here's Mary Macy. 
Yeah, I want to break free of these chains. A chronic illness, you really feel like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Well, it started off with bleeding from my bowel, which is pretty scary. And uh, that's been kind of an ongoing thing. Extreme abdominal pain, sweats, fevers. Along with that, also a lot of depression as well and anxiety. It's unclear how, but Diane caught a tummy bug called Clostridium difficile, or C. difficile. It's a superbug that can be virtually impossible to treat. There is a percentage of patients with C. difficile infection who will go into the relapsing stage where you cannot get rid of the bug because it makes spores. But Professor Thomas Barodi has been using a radical treatment to cure this condition. You're aware of that? Yes. I went reading literature and I came across this paper from 1958 where an inflammatory condition responded to restoration of the bowel flora. It's called human probiotic infusion. Put simply, Diane will be infused with someone else's faeces. We have a bank of donors who we know and we test every few weeks. Donors have to be healthy people who have been screened for any known poss possible disease and their stools are tested. With some saline homogenised in a blender, filtered through a simple kitchen type filter until it's able to be injected through a channel inside the colonoscope. It's hard to believe that this faeces could be a medical therapy. Bowel flora is made up of huge numbers of bacteria. So poo is a zoo. It contains living animals, you can call it bacteria. So it's a living organ that lives inside our colon. It has a few jobs, including destroying the waste. It itself is not waste. So the transplantation procedure brings in bacteria which were removed and they implant. I'm about to follow Diane as she undergoes this confronting treatment which she hopes will change her life. Yeah. Big day for you today? Yes, it is, and I'm, I'm just so excited. Yeah? Yeah. So you don't feel too icky having some donor faecal material being transplanted in? I know that it does sound a bit gross yeah. and a bit undignified and not very ladylike, yeah. but um, at the end of the day, I just want to be restored and have my life back. Yeah, exactly. C. difficile releases a toxin that destroys the bowel lining and causes ulcers. The symptoms are similar to severe food poisoning and in extreme cases can lead to death. The worst strain that we know of started in Canada around the year 2000, where it is thought it mutated and produced the super strain. It's now moved into North America and the first strains have arrived, but they're in very low numbers in Australia. Should we be concerned about this? I think we should be. There are measures that have been put in place to try and prevent the spread of it. But once a hospital is infected, it's very difficult to disinfect the hospital. Dr Barodi is not being an alarmist. He says this infection has become an epidemic in the US killing around 300 Americans every day. So we feel like pretty bad inflammation throughout. He believes antibiotics are one of the major causes. Overuse of antibodies can certainly damage your bowel flora, or the microbiome as we call it. And so for the last 50 years, we have been hitting our bowel flora with antibiotics. And so now we're trying to repair it. Seven years ago, Coralie was struck down by a strain of C. difficile after taking a course of antibiotics for a simple dental procedure. I couldn't believe I was in so much pain that I, I well, I really thought that my life was over. So, changed everything. The antibiotics she took were toxic to the good bacteria in her bowel, allowing resistant ones like C. difficile to thrive. I never ate thing because the severity of the pain, I was unable to walk. So it was not good. 
you still seem really affected by it. Yeah. Coralie was one of the first patients to have a faecal infusion. She wasn't very happy going ahead, but because she was so ill, she agreed to have an implant. After a single infusion, Coralie noticed a dramatic improvement. For the first week after, there wasn't one case of severe symptoms. So you were already seeing improvements a week after the procedure? Definitely, right. definitely. And then what happened? By the fourth week, I was symptom free. Dr Barodi boasts a 95% success rate. The theory is the donor faeces acts like a probiotic to restore the balance of good and bad bacteria in the gut. A bit of blood test there. Yes. Diane is now being sedated, ready for her infusion of donor faeces. A routine colonoscopy reveals the extent of damage in her bowel. It certainly does look quite ulcerated, doesn't it? That's a colitis. Quite bad. A lot of cobblestoning and pseudo polyps. Us. It's time for the faecal slurry to be infused in Dianne's colon. These bacteria have been through a blender, so they're kind of dizzy. And after a few hours, they find an environment there which is warm, dark, and it becomes their new home. This is the last syringe going in now, and we're just going to flush it through with some saline. 60 to 80 per cent of the donor stool bacteria remains in the recipient. And I believe they make molecules which kill off not just the bugs, but also the spores. Are you happy with the procedure? Yes, I'm happy with what we did. So what do you expect in the next couple of weeks? Well, she should reduce having a frequency of diarrhea. And if you look inside there again, it'll be more healed. She will have less urgency and possibly less blood being passed. Dr Barodi says our attitude towards faeces needs to change. It's made up mostly of bacterial cells and the number of bacteria is a fascinating statistics. There's about nine times more living bacterial cells in our stool than there are living cells in our body. So in effect, we are 10% human and 90% poo. The big question now is whether this rather rudimentary science will move beyond the need for using human faeces. Ultimately, there will be a non-faecal method of doing it, but I think that might take some years. So, how are you feeling? Um, I'm feeling good, considering, yeah. Still just a little bit uncomfortable, but, you know, I feel really just mentally at peace. What are you looking forward to most? Just regaining those uh, natural pleasures of life because this condition has left me completely spent. Yeah. And so just have the energy to enjoy life, live life and live it to the full. So that to me is just going to be the best. Hmm. Three weeks later, Diane is free of stomach pain. And she's hopeful she'll stay that way. Many people are scared of germs, but truth is we are more microbe than human. In fact, the microbes in our bodies outnumber our cells 10 to 1. This gang of bodily microbes is known as the microbiome. US health scientists are now getting to know the individuals that make up the microbiome to better understand their role in our bodies. Hello. Amongst other things, they've learned our skin has a microbial fingerprint which may be used to forensically link us to crime scenes, just like DNA traces. Uh -oh. Eventually, they hope to analyze and genetically sequence 900 of these little tackers, which will have huge benefits for understanding human health and disease. So next time you're getting paranoid about germs, remember there's a me in microbiome. So you think you can speak dog? Let's find out, shall we? This is an audience participation section, so one of you in the room quickly grab a pen and paper. Now, I have here a series of dog barks, each recorded in a different situation, 
and you lot are going to tell me what the dog meant by each bark. Isn't that right? Here are the situations. A, left alone. B, stranger at gate. C, about to go for a walk. D, asking for ball. E, vigorous play, like tug of war or chasey. Right, I have a group of dog owners over there. Let's go test them, and you at the same time. Hi there. Hello. Ready? All right. So you ready for the first one? Yep. So which scenario do you think this is? A, B, C, D or E? Write it down. Okay, bark number two. Bark number three. These are all dog owners. But for good measure, let's also test some people who've never even owned a dog. OK, ladies. Ready? Ready. And you've never owned a dog, is no. that right? That's correct. OK, Faye. Okay. Ready? Take Thanks, this. Thanks, Jonica. Bark right, number four. And we're up to bark number five. <laughs> and what do you at home think? OK, you ready for the results? Number one was B. <coughs> two, D. <coughs> three, A. <coughs> four, E. <coughs> and five, C. <coughs> you got? Five, five out, out of five! five. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, four out of five. Not very good. Congratulations, looks like you can speak dogs. Three out of five. Each of the subjects did better than random guessing. But what was really interesting was that even the people who'd never had a dog did pretty well. Are you surprised by the result? Yeah, I am actually. I didn't expect to get that many right. <laughs> What you've all just done is a simplified version of a groundbreaking experiment from Hungary. Now here's the really, really, really interesting thing about this research. Until recently, dog barking wasn't taken all that seriously by scientists. Adult wolves and dingoes rarely bark, and dog barking was thought to be a sort of messy, meaningless, all-purpose shout. But the Hungarian researchers proved that even humans who'd never owned a dog were really good at working out what the bark meant. Far from being boring, they suggest dog barking may have co-evolved with humans to facilitate communication between our two species. Really, it is amazing how easy most of us find it to understand this funny little animal. My thoughts exactly. Next time on Catalyst, a special edition all about sleep. With babies... Should babies sleep alone? Do teenagers have a good excuse for staying up late and sleep in pain? Breaking the vicious cycle. You'll have to stay up late for that one. Now, for more information, go to our website where you can also view and download stories. And do stay in touch with us on Facebook and Twitter. Now, we'll leave you with some remarkable footage of Thai elephant teamwork. See you next time. It said elephants never forget. But how much can they learn? Here in Thailand's northern hills, Joshua Plotnik and his team are establishing whether this group of pachyderms can learn to work together. A food-laden platform is placed just out of the elephant's reach. If only one elephant pulls on the attached rope, it simply unthreads. But a pair of elephants simultaneously tugging with their trunks obtain the treat. They quickly learn the task takes two, and so wait for a partner before starting. 
And when the rope is out of reach for one, the other doesn't waste its energy trying. One cheeky youngster even figures out how to cheat by using her foot to hold the rope so her partner does all the work. This is the first experimental evidence of learned cooperative behaviour in elephants. Elephants who are always willing to lend a helping trunk. 